From the combined newsrooms of KARK4 and Fox 16, breaking news coverage. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, daily uh, COVID-19 update that uh, we uh, took a leave of absence for the last two days. Uh, but it's important to re-engage on this from a uh, communication standpoint uh, and make sure everyone understands exactly where we are in Arkansas, uh, what's ahead, and uh, what we need to be doing. I am joined, of course, by uh, Secretary uh, Nate Smith uh, and uh, Director A.J. Gary of the uh, Department of Emergency Management. Uh, let me first give you a uh, case update. And the uh, case update uh, shows that yesterday uh, we had 1,280 cases. Uh, there's been an addition of 130 uh, new cases, so we have a total of 1,410 cases. Uh, we have 74 that are hospitalized, and we have 30 deaths, and uh, Dr. Uh, Smith will elaborate on some of those statistics. I did want to talk about uh, uh, some of the new cases that we have. As I mentioned, we have 130 new cases. Of those, we have a uh, uh, situation in the Federal Correctional Institute in Forest City in which we have been engaged in significant testing through our department. resulted in 55 positives within uh, the uh, Federal Correctional Institute there in Forest City. Uh, that's 35 uh, uh, or more inmates, staff, and one independent contractor, all within that confined environment. In addition, we have uh, our first real significant uh, breakout uh, in of the virus uh, in our state prison, which is our Cummins uh, Maximum Prison Unit, in which we have a maximum security unit, one barrack, uh, that has tested 43 out of 46 uh, positive in that uh, one uh, barracks. And so you can see from these two, uh, both FCI and uh, in Forest City, as well as the prison uh, in Cummins, that we have 98 of our cases are from a shelter-in-place environment. And so you have to put that in perspective as to where we are uh, in terms of our testing, the testing that comes from the commercial labs is still a very, very low percent positive, but as we concentrate in one of our prisons where there's been an outbreak, you have a very high percent of positives, and we focus our testing energy and capability to identify and isolate uh, the uh, uh, breakout of the virus within that environment. Obviously, you want to be able to contain it, Secretary Kelly, we met with today, is working very hard to make sure that, first of all, uh, we do the right amount of testing there, so that's our focus. Uh, secondly, uh, that we uh, isolate them within uh, barracks that uh, have tested positive, and then they have the proper medical treatment uh, that obviously everyone expects for anyone who has uh, come down with this virus. And so, that's a little bit of report on uh, where we are. The restriction on visitors has been in place from really day one uh, there within the prison environment, and that restriction continues. I did want to go to a couple graphs today, and if we can pull the uh, first graph up. And this is the number of newly admitted uh, COVID-19 patients. which uh, are really the new hospitalizations uh, each day that occur. So you can see on the first day we have March 23, we have five newly hospitalized. Of course, we had a spike, we had zero, and then it goes up to 28 newly hospitalized. And so these are the each day numbers that you can see for new hospitalizations. Whenever there's a blank, that means there have been zero that have been newly hospitalized. And if you go on down to the uh, latest time frame, which is uh, April 12th there, uh, we have uh, you know an additional number that are hospitalized. But you can see the hospitalizations, while it peaked there 
uh, about April 9th, it has gone steadily down or steady state uh, since that time. And if you go to the next slide, uh, which is the number of currently admitted uh, patients, which is really our hospitalizations. And this is one of the things I've said from the very beginning that we should be tracking. And so you start March 23, we had 10 uh, that were hospitalized, and these are total numbers that are hospitalized. And then, of course, it, it goes up, uh, where it's 48, and then it goes up to a 65, and then it uh, peaks with about uh, 85 uh, that were hospitalized on April 11th. And since then, you can see uh, that the hospitalizations have been steady around somewhat of a decline. And then if you go to the uh, last graphic, uh, which is the number of active cases versus recovered cases, uh, Dr. Smith reviewed this, uh, I believe it was last week. We've updated it, of course, to the current. So let me describe uh, the different, uh, what you see here. First on the uh, top line, uh, you have uh, the number of positive cases as a whole. And they're always going to go up. Uh, because it's a cumulative number and you add to that every day. So the top line is always going to go up and it is, as we indicated today, right over 1,400. And then the second line uh, is the, uh, the number of, of uh, active cases. And of course that is after you subtract the recovered cases, which is the blue line. So the blue line is the recovered cases and then the, uh, this second line uh, is the active cases that we have, which is the differential. And you can see that that continues to uh, go up, but it is uh, while, while the recovered cases uh, continues as well. And then the bottom line are the number of deaths, which is a low number uh, that is fairly uh, 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 low in comparison to the other cases. And so here's the message that I want to leave today with this slide being left up there just for a second. And that is that there's not any indication that we have reached the peak yet. Now, uh, we don't, we're, we're hoping that uh, the peak comes sooner versus later. But I'll remind you that uh, as you flatten, and that's what we've done, as you flatten the number of cases that you have and reduce the increase, then you're going to extend uh, the, the peak time period, which is the objective that we've had. And so the University of Washington first had our, uh, uh, about two weeks ago, they had our peak come in at April 24th. Now they've increased it now to April 29th. Why did they do that? It's because we flattened the curve, but that extends the trend line as well. And, and so keep in mind, everyone, that we have not yet reached our peak, both in terms of projections, but also in terms of where we see the trend line going. And so it's not a time to let up. It's not a time to uh, decrease uh, our intensity on, on uh, social distancing, on, on avoiding the gatherings of more than 10, and also on wearing face masks when you cannot appropriately social distance. I'm amazed at how well the Arkans Arkansans are doing on this. I want to thank you, but it's not a time to let up in that way. Now this last weekend, you saw a number of uh, references about when are we going to open up uh, on some of the talk shows. And, and uh, uh, one of our leading doctors used the phrase, uh, we might have a rolling reentry program where we open up businesses again. And so the conversation is starting nationally about that. Uh, I want to caution that we cannot uh, change the direction we're going at the present time. Now is not the time to let up. I want to keep us going in this same direction because uh, you can see that we're still going up in the trend line. Uh, we have flattened the rate. We have re decreased the growth rate, but we're not there yet. And so everyone do not let up despite some of the national conversation. And the national conversation is coming because people have stayed cloistered as long as they can stay in being cloistered and they want to see things return to some level of normality. I think we in Arkansas have kept 
a, a consistent pace about this. We've lowered the trajectory, but we should not give up and quit on this. We can deal with this, and we've got to be able to do that. And so my admonition is that we have to assume that we have not reached our peak yet, so let's stick with it. And then secondly, until we have reached our peak and are confident of that, then we've got to wear our mask, we've got to socially distance, and you've got to avoid uh, large gatherings. And then uh, I do want to look to the future for a second. And the future is about figuring out what we do when we are confident that we're at the peak and on the downward side of that slope. And I'm announcing today the appointment of a medical advisory board for COVID-19 post-peak. And let me rephrase that name again. It's a medical advisory board for COVID-19 post-peak. I am interested in looking ahead as to when we start going down that downward slope. I've asked uh, Dr. Nate Smith to chair this, but we'll be releasing uh, the names of seven uh, highly uh, skilled epidemiologists and others that have engaged in infectious diseases uh, that will be the medical advisory team that will help give us guidance as to what does it look on the downside of that slope. What should be our criteria that we look at? Uh, what do we need to do to avoid peaks in the future? What do we need to do to see not see a resurgence of this? And how can we live in this environment? What kind of mitigation efforts do we need to have in place? That's what I'll be tasking uh, them to do and to help develop the criteria that should be used to keep us on the downslope of new cases and to avoid the peaks later in the year. And so with that, I want to thank uh, Dr. Smith again for his leadership and ask him uh, to make any comments. Thank you, Governor. I want to give a little bit more detail on the numbers that the uh, Governor shared. Uh, the governor shared that we have 130 new cases uh, today compared to yesterday at this time, uh, and that is our uh, single largest uh, increase in 24-hour period of time. Over the weekend, we had uh, in the 50s uh, increase each day, which had been less than we had uh, had been averaging prior to that. Um, the reason for the increase, um, I'll go over as I go through our lab numbers. Uh, of the, uh, we had. Um, uh, 1,030 uh, test reports yesterday, 883 of those were from uh, commercial labs, and the positivity rate uh, was 2.9%, which is about what we have been seeing. We also had 53 from UAMS lab, and their positivity rate was 5.7, which is about what we had been seeing uh, before. Uh, 94 of those were from the Arkansas Department of Health Public Health Lab, and 71% of those were positive. And the reason for that is we were selectively testing uh, populations, particularly incarcerated populations. And so of the 67 new positives from the Arkansas Department of Health Public Health Lab, most of them were from uh, the Cummins unit and other incarcerated or congregate settings. Uh, these are high-risk settings where COVID-19 can spread very easily, very rapidly, uh, but they're also closed systems and they don't necessarily represent uh, the situation in Arkansas in general. Uh, but in the Cummins unit, as the governor's mentioned, we had 43 tests positive and a barracks of 46. Uh, so you can understand how efficiently COVID-19 can be spread in that setting. We have also had in our Little Rock uh, community corrections uh, over a period of a couple of weeks, we've had 27 staff test positive. We now have had five of 15 inmates test positive. So we'll be testing all of the inmates at the Little Rock community corrections. Uh, and we also, um, the governor has mentioned, the Federal Correction, uh, Correctional Institute in Forest City, uh, we are up to 46 inmates, eight staff, and one contractor. Uh, the testing strategy there is not entirely under co our control because it's a federal facility. Uh, the CDC director, Robert Redfield, has indicated that CDC will be taking the lead on that investigation, and um, uh, their plan is to implement 
a uh, risk-based testing strategy, uh, but we can expect to have additional positives from there as well. Uh, there is also a uh, uh, a smaller facility, a, a drug uh, rehab uh, treatment facility um, in uh, central Arkansas uh, that had 15 uh, residents test positive and nine staff, so 24 total. So you can see we had quite a few positives because we were testing in our highest risk uh, settings, and we'll continue to do that. That's uh, the way uh, it's most strategic for us to use our testing capacity uh, at the Arkansas Department of Health Public Health Lab. Uh, as the governor mentioned, we have um, a total now of 1,410 cumulative cases, uh, and that's 989 active cases. We have one new county, which is Jackson County. Uh, we have 74 currently hospitalized. Uh, that uh, includes uh, eight uh, new hospitalizations, uh, newly hospitalized from yesterday. We have a total of 28 uh, on a ventilator, and uh, we're up to 30 deaths, as the governor uh, mentioned before. We have 193 uh, healthcare workers um, uh, who have tested positive, of whom 58 have recovered. Uh, the last thing that I'd like to mention uh, may seem very unrelated to what I've just been talking about, uh, summer camp. Um, around the dinner table last night, my college-age son mentioned that he was uh, planning on going back and being a camp counselor this summer, as he's done for the last uh, few years. And um, I suggested to him that they may not be having summer camp. Um, and uh, uh, that was a little bit of a surprise to him, but it shouldn't be a surprise to the rest of us, although there's a big difference between summer camp and a maximum uh, security unit uh, to the COVID-19 virus, uh, there's not that much of a difference. Uh, you bring together people from all over the country, putting them in a, a highly congregate setting for a week or so, and then you send them back even if we were on the downside of cases at that point, um, that's a high risk setting for a resurgence. So uh, we will be sending out some guidance on summer camps just to help those who are involved in that to, to plan and prepare. With that, I'll turn it back over to the governor. With that, we'll take uh, any questions. I guess what measures have been in place in the uh, prisons, not even prior to this, because it seems like, like you guys said, once it, it blew up, it, it really got hold of the, both of those facilities. Well, actually, uh, in terms of Cummins, it's one barrack. So you think of the whole prison complex, and you have one open barrack, and in that barrack, you had, I believe it was 43 out of 46 that tested positive. So as Dr. Smith says, it shows how quickly it can, it can disperse. In terms of the measures that were in place prior to this, the key is there was no outside visitors. And uh, that was put into place immediately because that's what brings the outside contact in. So we prohibited outside visitors coming in. You have to remember what a hardship that is for the prisoners, but it's necessary. And then uh, secondly, uh, as I pointed out, the uh, prison uh, industries have started making masks internally and so they have masks that are available for uh, the uh, guards as well as uh, for the inmates uh, which would be not N95 mask, surgical mask, but a mask that they can use and, and, uh, and separate each other from the spread of the, of the virus. And then it's the cleaning aspect of it as well. So all those things have been put into place, putting those protective measures that come in and uh, uh, despite all of that, we've had this one breakout, but you contain it, and hopefully that it will not uh, be uh, impacting any other barracks. We'll have to wait and see. Do we know yet how it got in there, or what the, I guess, patient zero of the prisons were? Dr. Smith, I've heard some, but you better comment. At this point, we don't have any staff who have tested positive, but uh, we'll, we'll be testing staff and we'll be sampling uh, inmates from other, uh, other barracks as well uh, to make sure we're not missing anyone. Uh, part of the challenge in a, in a congregate 
living setting there is, um, you know, there are people who uh, are infected and who have no symptoms or mild symptoms, uh, and in a, in a situation where people are all living together, it's quite possible that the virus can spread even from people who don't have symptoms or who have minimal symptoms. Uh, so it's a, uh, the fortunate thing about that kind of setting is that it's, um, it's not that hard to contain it because people aren't going out and about. Um, they're, not, they're not leaving the, the prison, uh, but it is challenging for the prison uh, to be able to um, do the testing and, and, and uh, segregate those who test positive from those who test negative. Uh, but we're advising them, we're working closely with them. Has any population been hospitalized or put on um, I believe that um, one individual from Cummins has been hospitalized, but I'm not sure their status. Are you worried about the disease spreading out of barracks? Uh, certainly, there's a concern there, which is why uh, we've, we've already worked with them to make sure that the staff who work with that barracks don't work with other barracks, that we don't have inmates going uh, you know, from one barracks to another, and that uh, those in that barracks won't be uh, mingling with others either during recreation time or during uh, meal time. There are some who would like to see the governor uh, use his pardon and commutation powers to thin the ranks of inmates. Well, this this is uh, probably an example of where. Uh, that would be unwise. Uh, if you look at the, uh, there's a reason that these inmates are in a maximum security unit. And so uh, I don't see that happening. Uh, now, you know, if it spreads more broadly, uh, you know, there are potential uh, plans that uh, we could look at uh, some uh, offenders that are close to their release date but uh, we're not uh, close to being a having to do that now. Uh, let's see where we go uh, from here. Whenever it's not uh, in any other barracks or any other prison units, then uh, there's not any reason to do it in those facilities. And then this one is in a maximum security unit for a reason. I mean, they're there for a reason, and so we don't want to release those, and we hope that it is contained there. So that's something you have to look at day by day. Uh, and situation by situation, but uh, I don't see, uh, hopefully that won't uh, have to happen. Dr. Smith, what's been the average hospital stay for any of these patients? It's uh, difficult for us, uh, while we're still in it, to know exactly what the average is because there are many of the patients who are still hospitalized. Of those who've been discharged, we did that analysis last week and uh, found that the average was six days. Um, uh, that, uh, is a, that may have changed uh, since then, but I think six, seven days is about what we would expect with this. Uh, there are certainly those who were uh, in the hospital much longer. There are some who have been in the hospital, really uh, still are in the hospital. So uh, those who get on a ventilator, we know uh, from our national experience, uh, it tends to be more like two weeks uh, or more on a ventilator. So that's certainly longer than, um, than that shorter six-day period. Is there a Go ahead, a question here, then we'll take one remotely. And um, did the federal prison, is the CDC doing its own testing, or is that the health department doing testing on behalf of the CDC? Or? In terms of the Federal Correctional Institute in Forest City, uh, up to this time we've been advising them and, uh, and working with them on that. We had a team from CDC who came down the latter part of last week and then uh, left on Saturday. They gave some recommendations, but they'll continue to engage that uh, prison. And a particular piece that's not yet been fully sorted out is a risk-based testing strategy. We have done some testing for that, um, for that federal facility, uh, but but um, there are quite a few inmates there and um, uh, that uh, would take a while with our current capacity to, um, to test all of those. Let, let me. I have a question from Mentos. Right. Um, help me. Just, just one second here. Let, just one second. Let me add to that, and I, uh, Dr. Smith, you can correct me if I'm in error here, but 
uh, all of the testing that has been done there has been uh, through and statistically has been added to our numbers here. So whether it's a CDC number or a Department of Health test, those numbers count in our Arkansas statistics. Is that correct, Dr. Schmidt? I just want to make that point. And now let's go remotely. Please uh, go ahead and give your question. Sure. This is uh, Jessica Jaguars from WMC in Memphis. I have a couple questions. First, um, Governor Hutchinson, can you please clarify what you mean by a shelter in place? First of all, uh, in terms of the phraseology that I used, uh, Dr. Smith used the term congregate settings. Well, a congregate setting is a closed environment, which is a prison setting, uh, and that's the context in which I said uh, they are, in essence, all the prisoners are sheltering in place. They are in a congregate type setting. Uh, certainly, there's uh, independent contractors, there's people that come in and out of that environment, but uh, they are sheltered in place in that congregate setting. In terms of the other questions that you ask about uh, the facilities there and how it's done, that's a federal facility and so it's not something that I can control, it's not something that Dr. Smith can control or the state can control, uh, that's run by the uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons. And so anything would have to be addressed to, to them on uh, the operations of the facility. Uh, in terms of the CDC, uh, they came in at our request, did an evaluation of that. It's my understanding they've gone back to Atlanta, uh, and we've asked them to come and to take responsibility for that uh, because, uh, you know, it's a lot of testing resources uh, that will be used in that federal facility if we're required to do it. And, uh, you know, as Dr. Smith says, you know, there ought to be risk-based testing there, which is really, you know, who they've been in contact with. Let's test those in the same barrack, and uh, we don't have to test everybody in the prison, but you take it one step at a time to see who might be exposed to it and do that testing. And so I, that's uh, uh, in discussions with uh, CDC as to whether they will, uh, and the Bureau of Prisons will accomplish that uh, objective that we've recommended. Back. Yes. Question about summer camp. When you talk about summer, you're talking about June, July, August, September? Well, I have particularly in mind um, uh, with many of these summer camps, they start bringing together the people who are going to work there in early May. Um, and uh, so bring a bunch of college kids or whoever from different parts of the country together living in the same sort of barracks uh, type of setting um, as they're preparing for campers, you know, that itself is a risk. So what, when you say, uh, how long is this directive going to last? At least well, I, I would certainly, I would hope that, uh, that we'll eventually be to a point where we can safely do that, but um, uh, the COVID-19 virus is not exactly on my time timetable, but um, I think we need. I think I can say with confidence that we're based on where we are right now, uh, bringing together a bunch of campers or even counselors in in May doesn't sound like a good idea at all. Will that directive also apply to recreational sports and soccer tournaments, baseball, softball, etc.? I think we already have a directive that covers that. Thank you. Stay as far as tracing goes. Are we going to be pursuing a tracing program, something like that? You're talking about contact tracing. Um, yes, we continue to do contact tracing, but our main focus is on the, on these um, congregate settings, these high-risk settings, uh, nursing homes, uh, incarcerated uh, populations. Um, you know, others where you have uh, the greatest risk of transmission in the shortest period of time. Uh, and that's, that's just wise use of resources. But we've uh, continued to grow our, our, uh, our team. Um, last time I gave numbers as far as uh, the number of people
people doing contact tracing. I, I went back and, and my staff corrected me because we continue to, to train and, and, um, uh, and expand our capacity um, and we'll continue to do that. I've been in conversations with CDC as well. Uh, their intention is to um, supplement our efforts as well in various ways, uh, understanding that contact tracing and case follow-up are just as important on the downside of this curve as they are on the upside. Can I ask a follow-up question over the remote link? Yes. You mentioned uh, the, the schools obviously being closed until the end of the school year and talking now about uh, summer camps and people from congregating in those settings, yet daycare centers continue to remain open. So how do you address parents who have kids in K-12 or beyond that you know, may use summer camps as their summer daycare, yet daycares remain open? Now, the daycares that you asked about, daycares can remain open. Is, is that your point? Yeah, I guess the question is, how do you address parents who have children in K-12 who use summer camps as their daycare? How are they supposed to take care of their children this summer if, if daycares or if, um, if the summer camps end up being limited? Well, it's important to note that we have not closed daycares in Arkansas. And so daycares can continue to operate. Obviously, they need to do their distancing within there and have their health protocols in place. But they can continue to operate. In fact, we've encouraged them because they're so important for our health care workers, our emergency responders, and essential services, and on down the line. And so uh, it's uh, probably even a greater hardship in the summer, but we hope that uh, they will be able to stay in place. And we hope that uh, things can change quickly. Uh, I visit with Dr. Smith about summer camps. I know how important they are. And we have a lot of great summer camps here in Arkansas that's really their, their ministry or their business. Uh, they, they do that, and that's what their property and their assets are there for. Uh, but uh, so I hope that we can have such success that we can end this emergency and we can reopen those camps, but they needed to know in advance that they can't plan, you know, on May 20th or May 30th having summer camp, and particularly when they come from out of state, they need some advance notice on that. And so until the emergency's over and we're clear of this, then that's just something they should not plan on. ACLU and Florida family. Uh, planning services uh, sued the state today in terms of the abortions. Uh, any response to that? Uh, it's not unexpected, uh, but in terms of uh, our actions, uh, we took the same action toward this clinic as we would any other clinic that was violating a directive in terms of not engaging in elective surgical procedures. And so we followed the same process. Uh, they chose uh, rather than, well, they chose to take it into court. We'll see what the uh, court says on that. Well, I guess what, what is that line when it comes to abortions, when it becomes elective and a necessity? Where do, you, where do you guys kind of draw that line at? Well, of course, the, the, the line of distinction was between uh, medic, medication abortions and surgical abortions. And there was a distinction that was made in the directive in that regard. More details on the advisory board and when you expect to, to name the members? Uh, we've named them already, uh, uh, and uh, Katie will provide that uh, uh, as soon as this is over with. I could actually give you the names, but I left that one sheet of paper <laughs> in my office. We'll have that for you. Is there a second positive test amongst anyone, or have we seen that yet? Not sure I understand the question. A second positive test? From, a, from one person who has recovered and then potentially tested positive. A second. Well, we have had uh, individuals who have, have tested positive and then after they've recovered from their symptoms, someone has done another test to see if they've cleared the virus and they've tested positive again. Uh, we do recommend that in a hospital setting uh, because of the, the high risk of, uh, of 
of transmission if you take someone out of isolation. But for those who are an outpatient, um, uh, we recommend um, uh, a non-test strategy for uh, determining someone who's recovered, uh, consistent with CDC guidelines. Uh, it is possible that some of these tests, the PCR tests that we use, are very sensitive. They'll pick up a very small amount of, of virus. Um, whether that virus is viable or whether that virus is sufficient to actually transmit to someone, is, it doesn't really distinguish very well. Uh, so um, uh, we generally don't advise someone who's recovered and who's feeling well, they're outside of a hospital setting, uh, they don't need to get another test. Uh, but when they have been tested, sometimes uh, they have found a positive. One uh, final question from the table and we'll see if there's another one remotely. Uh, could we ask Dr. Smith about summer camps again? <laughs> So you're saying that summer camps might open in June? You kind of, when I try to pin you down, you kind of leave dodge? Well, I would prefer for us to make those decisions based on the most current information that we have. Um, sitting here in the middle of April, I don't have as much information as I will have middle of, middle of May, uh, middle of June. Um, you know, I, I would, it would be nice if we could uh, from what I'm seeing right now, it seems unlikely, but uh, I'd rather not rule that out, you know, until we have more information, more time goes on. Is there one additional question remotely? Yeah, Hi, Governor, hey, this is Andrew with AP. I um, wanted to see if you had any reaction to the President's uh, comments today that uh, his assertion that he, not the Governor, has the authority to uh, open up the states. Do your reaction to that but also be, you know, does that does that affect your your approach in terms of lifting any of the restrictions in Arkansas? Are you seeking their approval or coordinating with them before deciding what to do for reopening things here? I think there's been a good partnership with the uh, federal government. We've worked uh, closely. We just had a call with the vice president today, and uh, I don't see that there will be an issue there. We all want to move in the same direction in terms of, of winning this fight and getting back to normal activities, but uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the federal government uh, has not uh, declared the scope, and I don't know that they could do that. Uh, they've relied upon the states to manage this crisis in terms of uh, acquiring PPE with a, a backstop help from the federal government. They've allowed us to use our discretion in terms of, of uh, exactly the protective and safety measures that should be in, be in place, and we've utilized uh, that. Uh, so that's just simply a, a prerogative and and, and the way things should work in terms of, of the states having the flexibility to manage it, and I expect that to uh, continue. And I did hear one other question there, and we'll end with that. Was there another question remotely? Yes, thank you so much. This is Morgan at KTHD. Um, we were wondering if there's any instance of an outbreak within an Arkansas hospital. Um, I'm not aware of any instance of an outbreak within an Arkansas hospital. The only, uh, uh, we had the Arkansas State Hospital, which is, uh, the state-owned facility for uh, those that uh, are uh, mentally challenged or under observation. And we had a, uh, uh, I think it's about seven that tested positive there. And uh, we've uh, been able to uh, manage and work through that. And we're continuing to monitor that. With that, thank you for your attention today. And uh, we'll see hopefully you tomorrow. Thank you.